Despite numerous interviews with creative director Ian Fraser, it does appear that Star Wars Squadrons is going to get two massive content updates, the biggest updates the game has ever seen since launch. Guys, if you thought version 2.0 was big, let me tell you, this is even bigger. Starting from the 25th of November all the way into December, Star Wars Squadrons will be getting a new map, new components, private and custom matches, but the best thing of all, two new ships for both factions, the B-Wing and the terrifying TIE Defender. As you can tell, this update is including almost everything people have been asking for since the launch of the game. And guess what? It's all completely free to download for all platforms of the game in two content patches, version 3.0 on November the 25th and version 4.0 sometime in December as a Christmas update. Guys, I'm as shocked as you are, so let's not waste any time and get right into it. Let's start with the November update. Version 3.0 will bring additional fixes to the game, balance updates and other quality of life changes. I understand a very few amount of people were still getting the rank bug after resetting their ranked within version 2.0 of the game, so you will likely see some fixes there. Balance changes will be incoming too, so it'll be very interesting to see how they'll change the meta of the game. My theory is we'll see a nerf to the ion torpedoes and barrage rockets or auxiliaries, perhaps even some nerfs to the interceptor and its ability to bypass pass a lot of the flagship damage. But let's move on to the chonky bit of this update, the new map coming to the game, Foster Haven. Now some of you might be familiar with this map, as it was used as the prologue mission for the single player aspect of the game. Now, its 3D modelled environment and layout has been changed to support two factions fighting each other compared to its single player counterpart. So, some of the maps in Star Wars Squadrons can be considered relatively empty, with many people's favourite being the Nadiri Dockyards, as it's filled with many obstacles that favour the more experienced pilot. But with the introduction of Foster Haven, another obstacle heavy map, that could likely change. This was something I correctly predicted in a previous video actually, so why not hit that subscribe button and get clued up on more Squadrons content in the future. Okay, but what else for the November update? Well, the most interesting thing for me personally is the new components for all the ships in the game. The boost extension kit component for fighters and bombers allow players to get a full boost immediately, with a long charge time until it is able to be used again. I'm interested to see if this disables the use of adding overcharge to your boost meter thus changing the entire gameplay style. The second component they'll be getting is the prototype piercing torpedoes. These do less damage than your standard proton torpedoes, but they'll be able to pierce through the flagship shields. So this will be incredible to use against flagship subsystems whilst the shield generators are still up. But next is for interceptors and fighters. They'll be getting iron rockets, quite similar to the barrage rockets many players run in Eckhart's Ladder's interceptor loadout. Link to that video in the top right now if you want to know more. Iron rockets are slower than their barrage rocket counterpart, but it would seem to have a relatively similar rate of fire. These are incredible to strip down shields on frigates, cruisers and the flagship. Better yet, you can use both the ion rockets and the barrage rockets together, becoming an absolute force when it comes to offensive objectives. And finally, the support ships. The U-Wing and the TIE Reaper will be getting the anti-material rocket turret, an offensive objective component that you deploy behind you and they'll focus on flagship subsystems as well as turrets on a capital ship. As a support main, I'm actually really excited for this one personally. So let's dive right into the December update. There is no exact date for this version 4.0, but what is included is even bigger than the patch before it. Alongside the content patch, there will be bug fixes to version 3.0 if there is any. But anyway, the new ships, the immensely effective B-Wing for the New Republic and the insanely devastating all-purpose TIE Defender for the Empire. Let's start with the B-Wing. One really cool attention to detail the developers put in is that there's going to be a cosmetic variant of the B-Wing seen in Return of the Jedi. It's obviously going to be a bomber class and will also feature a unique gyro cockpit and swiveling wings. So how that will play out in gameplay will be super interesting indeed. We'll make a separate video on this when the content patch drops, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that video. It will use all the same choosable components the Y-Wing can pick, but will have different base stats before the bonus stats are applied from the player's loadout. The blog post doesn't have those stats, however, so we'll have to wait until that update drops for those. Now, onto the TIE Defender. I know this ship has had an absolute outpour of requests to be included in this game, and I genuinely can't believe it's finally here. The TIE Defender will be in the fighter class, so it will share all the components with a TIE Fighter. The biggest difference is the fact that the ship will have shields, 
just like the TIE Reaper, also on the Empire faction. This ship will also have different stats to the TIE Fighter also. It's very obvious these two ships are much more powerful than the current roster of ships available in the game. It's why I was so adamant they weren't going to be added. However, for obvious gameplay reasons, they will be balanced out. Understandably so, for the purpose of the game. There will be situations in the game where a Y-Wing will be favoured over a B-Wing, same with the TIE Fighter over the Defender. We just don't know what those situational differences will be yet, but either way, I am very excited. Next up is one feature so many people were begging for, private and custom matches. The developers saw the success that came with the esports tournaments such as the Operation Ace, one that we actually took part in actually, and the Creators Clash, which myself and Corey Losers was in for free games with Bombastic's team. So to help carry on the want to see more of those tournaments, they finally added in the ability to create your own matches. So you're probably wondering why I'm calling it private and custom matches. Well, well, it's more than just making a custom 5v5 and calling it that. Turns out the developers wanted to go above and beyond by allowing you to do either a 1v1, 2v2, 3v3 and so on. You'll be able to choose between either dogfight or fleet battle mode and also the modifiers too. So you can change things like the hull, shields, damage, capital ship health, restricting certain starfighters and many other tools to change the way you play. As well as a server browser so you can join all the games you want. This is one feature that I think will make Star Wars Squadrons last for years to come. There are going to be so many different ways to play with these modifiers and many different player made game modes alongside it. And I know some of you out there were hoping for some form of RP servers too. Well, you got it. And the server browser is just the cherry on top if you ask me. At the beginning and end of the blog post, we see some words from the social and developer teams regarding the success of Star Wars Squadrons. The common theme I get from these messages by the team is appreciation. Creative director Ian Fraser chimes in with his experiences working with the team to create the game and the reception it has gotten since launch and how it was much more than they actually expected. Now, I've always had a strong belief in Star Wars Squadrons. We've made plenty of videos about it before its launch and plenty more after it. You can really tell it was a game created with pure passion by Ian and the team in general. And the general reception of the game on launch was just as successful. I have to admit, I was bummed out by the news of there being no new content coming to the game. And I was worried about how long I'd be playing this game for with the knowledge that this is what we're going to get. But the fact that developers decided to give us pretty much everything we wanted and more in updates that they didn't need to do, by the way, really strengthens the idea that this game was definitely made out of love. And it's great to see the guys at EA Motive not wanting to move on just yet. So a massive thanks to Ian and the team on this one. You're genuine real ones, guys. So there was an absolute ton of information here. So I don't think I can go through everything in one video. But now that we know what's coming, let's go over how it affects you, the player. So first on the list is the new map, Foster Haven. I strongly predicted that we'd see some content shift from single player campaign over to the multiplayer side of things. Foster Haven is an environment dense map meaning that more experienced pilots will be able to shake the tail of enemy ships easier through complex maneuverability and riskier pathways. Because of the environment, this will definitely weaken the power of player-to-player -player missiles, whilst also making torpedoes easier to fire whilst out of view. Utility support players will have a harder time in this map, as it will make it more challenging to fire supply drops and tactical shields to their allies. If you want the appropriate training before the update drops, I recommend flying through Nadiri Dockyards as it is likely to be the closest in terms of map complexity. As for components, iron and barrage rocket combos could be very effective, but with the strength of iron torpedoes, I don't think it will be a suitable replacement. That is, if the balance changes coming to version 3.0 won't nerf the iron torpedo. I personally do believe it will. When playing as support, the U-Wing is easily able to drive through the shielding of the ISD and perfectly iron torpedo the power systems without having to take down the flagship's shields first. Whilst it is difficult to pull off, the risk is definitely too worth it for the reward. So I do believe the Iron Rocket's success will rely on those changes. Prototype piercing torpedoes on paper sound very strong, but it'll ultimately come down to how big of a damage nerf they'll have and how many a fighter or bomber can hold. If they behave the same as Iron and Proton torpedoes do, 1,500 meter lock-on range, with them unlocking at 400 meters, then I think they could be quite strong on SLEs and the Deere 
Fury's dockyards. Whilst being the weakest in Yavin due to its lack of physical objects to hide behind, it goes without saying, these will be useless on anything but the subsystems of flagships, so don't bother running them until the frigates or cruisers are down. Boost extension kit does sound interesting, but this feels like a modification to how the boost feature behaves, so until we know how long that cooldown is, will depend on how effective it will be. I have no more opinions on that until then. The final component is the anti-material rocket turret. This makes support ships more useful against objectives, as there isn't many support auxiliaries that make the U-Wing or TIE Reaper effective against objectives. Most of them are just there to support their allies. My biggest question is, will capital or flagships be able to destroy this thing? If not, then I think this could be very effective. If they can, then I'm not so sure. There isn't much information on how this thing will behave in game, so I'll hold off from further comment until then. As for the December version 4.0 update, I still can't get over how they're adding more ships to the game. I would honestly have betted money on the fact that they wouldn't have. Besides, the B-Wing and the TIE Defender are really powerful starfighters. It wouldn't have worked from a gameplay standpoint, but it appears they have, and I am very wrong. I'm very interested to see how they nerfed the TIE Defender and how players will initially feel having to manage shields on it. Many people enjoy playing the Empire because they trade out shields for more damage. It feels stronger in game feel and has a lower skill ceiling because of it. Expert players get more out of the New Republic ships as they can utilize their shield management to the highest efficiency. And without the power shunting feature found in Imperial ships, it forces them to manage their engines and lasers more. So for newer players or players in low ELO, I think they won't like the TIE Defender, but we'll have to wait and see. Finally, for custom matches, I'm going to leave that in a separate video. I think I'll make it when the feature actually drops so we can have working examples of my opinion. So if you want to see that video, go to subscribe man and hit that bell notification while you're at it. I think that's everything I want to say on the update now. Otherwise, we'll be here for too long. My question of the day to you guys is, are you looking forward to this update? You already know how I feel. I'm so pumped. It is unreal. But shout your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below. I'll read all of them and try to get back to some of you too. Oh, and whilst you're at it, if you have some time, check out our video on the High Republic video game. It's a really interesting topic and covers the great disaster event in some detail you might find interesting. Link to that video in the top right corner now or in the pinned comment down below if you prefer. But with that all said and done, I've been Charlie, you've been watching X2 and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.